Greetings, everyone. My name is Judy Njino, Executive Director, Global Compact Network, Kenya. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to the Global Compact Network, Kenya, Local Action Dialogue under the theme, Champions of Change, Tackling Biases and Backlash Against Gender Equality at the sidelines of the Target Gender Equality Live. The Kenyan network is excited to be among 19 countries currently participating in the 2020 UN Global Compact Target Gender Equality Program. What is certain is that achieving gender equality is too big of a task for any one sector. In many ways, business has been at the center of the call for transformation. From the Me Too and Time's Up movements, on the issue of systemic sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace to new legislation and exchange listing requirements that promote women's representation on corporate boards to the demand for greater investment in women-owned businesses and startups business leaders around the world are recognizing gender equality as a critical business issue and taking a variety of action to advance progress however while the progress to date has been welcomed by most, there is also a significant level of resistance emerging in response to the implementation of diversity initiatives that are aimed at advancing gender equality. During this session, business leaders will share how their organizations are setting ambitious targets and intentionally challenging and transforming the structures that perpetuate gender inequality. The leaders will also reflect on how business can understand and identify ways to address the backlash to progress. I wish to thank our speakers today, Ms. Catherine Musakali, founder and chair of the Women on Boards Network, Mr. Karioki Ngare, CEO Kenya and East and head of consumer private and business banking for Africa, Middle East and Europe at Standard Chartered Bank Kenya, Ms. Soraya Nafeld, CEO of RA International, and Ms. Alison Gibuini, CEO of Alison Production. At this point, I wish to invite our moderator for the session, Ms. Victoria Rubadiri, senior news anchor at Royal Media Services and award-winning journalist to guide the conversation. I hope everyone present today is inspired by the discussions and will take forward actions to accelerate the gender equality in this decade of action. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy, for that introduction. Uh, again, my name is Victoria Rubadiri. I'm a broadcast journalist based in Nairobi, Kenya, and I'll be driving the discussion during this session, an extremely important one as we seek to find ways and strategies to close the gender gap, specifically in the corporate space. Allow me to introduce our next speaker for this session, just to set the stage and the agenda for the discussion uh, during this session, Ms. Catherine Musakali, a founder and chair of the Women on Boards Network. Catherine. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Thank you everyone for having me this uh, uh, morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you're joining us from. And I'm happy to share some thoughts about a topic that is close to my heart. Now, I would like to start off my remarks by going back to the Equilib report that was done in 2019 on gender equality um, in Kenya. And one of the things that uh, that report found out is that the average score in terms of corporate boards, um, we have about 25% of women in senior leadership and on boards in Kenya. While that number has gone up from 21% uh, the previous year, we're still a long way off from achieving what we need to do. Now, Kenya is not alone. Across the world, it is actually the same. And gender inequality continues to thrive everywhere across the world. And when you look at political representation again, the story is not different. But allow me to start off by sharing uh, the words of Joanne Bush, 
who said the next frontier is toppling invisible barriers. Mindsets wildly held by managers, men and women alike, that are rarely acknowledged but block the way. When senior leaders commit themselves to gender diversity, they really mean it. But in the heat of the moment, deeply entrenched beliefs cause old forms of behavior to resurface. So what is it that causes these old forms to resurface, old beliefs to resurface? Publicly, very many of us will commit to gender equality. Privately, do we do the same? And so I want to say that for us to tackle these inequalities, there is need for us to change mindsets. And we have to start with why are we doing what we are doing? The business case for gender equality has long been established. Do we believe in that case? What does it mean for our businesses? We need to tackle resistance to this business case because indeed it's settled that gender equality delivers better business results. But many times we get insufficient executive support. Sometimes change is resisted because we ask for too much too soon. There is a level of uncertainty. There is People are afraid of change, but many times it is because of the people who are leading the change. There is ineffective leadership. So how can we then change minds so that we tackle this uh, backlash uh, and tackle the inequalities? And I think it's important that we reason. We reason together both men and women reason together. We use research to drive the business case. We resonate, we connect using IEQ, emotional intelligence. We listen to different perspectives and having heard the fears, having heard the differences, having heard the issues that are holding people back, we then use that knowledge to drive change. So it's important that we must drive change. But for us to drive change, we must be committed to some form of targets. And those targets that we commit to must have teeth for them to make sense. So gender equality starts from the top. It's the tone at the top. The board, must make gender diversity a priority. The CEO must make gender diversity a priority. And so it's important that we pay attention to the top, to the tone at the top. We must fast track women into leadership. We must ensure that we view gender diversity as an issue of strategy. Businesses must really build gender equality and gender diversity into their strategy for it to make sense. We must ensure that we develop diversity policies, gender neutral policies, raise awareness throughout the company on why this is important. But at the same time, women cannot do this alone. And that's why I'm so excited that Kariuki has joined us today. We must include men in this transformational agenda. And so just before I end, I want to talk about some of the strategies that organizations can adopt in order to achieve gender equality. So we must develop and adopt gender mainstreaming policies and strategies that support gender equity, that support gender equality. And it starts with gender budgeting. We must ensure that in our budgeting, we take into consideration gender. So gender budgeting. We must embrace flexi time. Men and women think differently, work differently. We must embrace flexi time. Telecommuting. 
at recruitment stage, and I know that at recruitment stage, we are recruiting almost 50% women and 50% men. But we must tackle the things that are holding women back from advancing to the top, the leaky pipeline, as they call it. Do we allow women back into organizations, for example, after they have had their children, the concept of returnship? We must work on networking platforms that help women advance in their careers. We must have training programs and follow up. And it is no secret that, is th that there is inequality in pay as well. So we must address equal pay, the issue of equal pay. Let's introduce things like job sharing. Let's introduce concepts like childcare policies, workplace creches, so on and so forth. Equal job opportunities and promotion for both men and women. Mentorship and sponsorship, that I have to emphasize. We must, as business leaders, ensure that we have put in place mentorship and sponsorship for our ladies so that we encourage them to rise to the top. We must recognize those organizations that are doing well in terms of gender equality. And at the same time, as I said earlier, we cannot have this discussion alone. Who are our male champions? And how can we involve them in this discussion? I think one of the most important financial strategies that we can adopt also is the concept of integrated reporting so that organizations are forced to report on the numbers, on the, um, uh, um, the, 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 the diversity elements within their organizations publicly tell their stakeholders the inequalities or the equalities that they have in terms of gender. That way, we then start to hold organizations accountable for what they have signed up to, having targets with teeth, so that we enforce some of those policies and strategies that will promote gender um, equality. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Great, great insights. Just in terms of what is still lacking uh, in terms of barriers that are holding women back from scaling the corporate ladder. And we want to get more into that and just take a deep dive into some of those points that Catherine raised. Let me introduce my panel really quickly. And before I do that, we have a hashtag that we want you to use as this conversation continues. If you hear anything that inspires you, that challenges you, that you want to share with your social media audience, the hashtag is target gender equality. My first panelist is Karioke Ngari, who is an accomplished career banker with nearly 30 years experience of retail banking experience. He is the managing director and chief executive officer of Standard Chartered Bank, Kenya and East Africa, as well as head of retail banking, Africa, Middle East and Europe. And prior to his current role, he was the global head for retail distribution for Standard Chartered Bank in Singapore. We also have Soraya Narfelt, who's the CEO of RA International, one of Africa's leading remote site service providers, offering everything from facility management to camp construction and supply chain services for clients. Soraya has been selected as one of the most influential women leaders by Arabian business three times, and was also a finalist for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2012. And last but not least is Alison Ngibuini, who is the CEO of Alison Productions Limited. She's also a biodata communication expert, award-winning producer, communication expert with over 15 years experience in content design and implementation of communication strategies. Thank you all for uh, taking the time out and engaging in this discussion. Karifi, let me begin with you. Um, you know, we heard from Catherine and how she said it's important that the change starts from the top, right? The tone at the top. You know, you've experienced different working cultures around the world. 
and from what you've been exposed to, why, why is leadership so key in achieving gender equality? Thank you, Victoria. I think there's something that uh, Catherine mentioned in her introduction, which is the tone at the top is what sets the scene for what happens there below. And uh, what we've seen is across my spanning career in, uh, in Standard Chartered, unless the tone is right, then what you're talking about is unlikely to ever happen. Because once you set the right tone, then it means you're going to invest as an organization uh, in, the, in the policies that you must put in place to, to make sure that happens. Then you must deliberately go out of your way to make sure that you're enhancing the genders, whichever uh, the, the women gender, to make sure that the workplace is conducive for them to work and thrive. And then, and most important as well, is that you're always looking out to continue sponsoring them. Because for instance, we've noted that for instance, in our organization in Kenya, you find 53% of our workforce is female. But once you get the senior management, the, ex the executive committee, that drops to 40%. So you must have very deliberate policies that keep on promoting so that they, they, when they join their career, they work throughout so that they can move to the ex, ex, ex core level and also to the board level. So the tone, at, the tone at the top determines all that. It cannot be anywhere else. So Raya, let me bring you in on that. And just to uh, take it from where Karyuki left it, you know, you see at the base of the pyramid, you have the right uh, ratio of women to men. For instance, it's 50% or beyond. And, and the higher up you go to that pyramid, it narrows. You, you see fewer and fewer women, right? So how do we begin to improve that supply chain to the top to get more women promoted, for instance, to get them to uh, showcase their talent and, and show management that they are capable? I think I'd like to go back to um, Catherine's comment about the leaky pipeline. I find that a lot of women who are, let's say, starting out and they have a career mapped out at the same time, they have a family ideals and they do go and they do have ch children. And then it becomes worrying, how do I work and take care of children? There's a whole guilt association that and I tend to see more drop off after the kids because the guilt of the balance of work work and, 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 and home life begins to eat at them. I mean, I'm a mother myself, and so I've had you know, many of those uh, moments when you are, want to be in one place, but you're obliged to be another. I think the way to help, and we do it quite well in-house, is the flexi time, not obliging people to have exactly set hours. And we had single mothers who need to be at school for teacher parent meetings, who need to pick up children who have other things. But I know that guaranteed these women will deliver the work that's required no matter what, no matter how. Now, I, I think that when organizations set too rigid a structure, it hampers women from being able to balance the work and home as a caregiver in most cases, and a lot of them pull back because as pressure increases as you go up the, you know, as the chain, you have a lot more work, a lot more commitment, you're responsible for a lot of other people. And it is a natural instinct in women to care and feel that overarching responsibility and they don't want to let other people down. I see it in house and we had a, a lovely lady and she was a single mom who said, well, you, you, you take care of your son when you need to and you do your work when you can, just know which deadlines you can meet. And I think that by leaders in companies pushing that down, the flexi time and the ability for them to return to work, not being obliged to set an exactitude of that will help a lot of the women climb up faster. Absolutely, absolutely. Alison, you know, you sit on, on several boards and, you know, I know you understand the criticality of leadership when it comes to driving um, gender equality. But, you know, when it comes to implementation, that part gets a bit tricky. Uh, and dealing with various triggers when it comes to fear, because people simply don't know what does this mean when we're talking about gender equality. Um, you know, there can be also change fatigue, people wondering how do we actually get this done? Or maybe gender is just a nice thing to have. It's not an obligation. So how do you deal with a lot of those perceptions when wanting to implement um, a strategy on gender equality? So 
Super. Thank you, Victoria. And first of all, I'm very happy to be sharing this uh, platform with the Champions of Change. So allow me to answer your question by telling a little story. So a long time ago, when I started in the film uh, industry, I got invited to sit on a government uh, body, a task force that was meant to formulate and set a policy structure for the formation of the Kenya Film Commission. And uh, there I was, I was really excited to have been appointed by the president. Wow, he knows I exist and he understands that there is a need to grow the film economy. And um, so I attended my first meeting and I got there really early and on, on time. And there was a few people gathered there and I decided, OK, let me settle down. And I picked my spot. And as I settled down I thought oh okay let me grab a, a cup of coffee so I went to the tea station and uh, when I was walking to the tea station I hear this voice shout at me young lady can you please get me a cup of tea with two sugars and I have to quickly count to 10 slowly and I'm like is he talking to me is he talking to somebody else so I proceed to the tea station I slowly pour myself a cup of coffee and a little sugar I turn around, carry my coffee and walk slowly and I go back and sit down and take a sip of my coffee. And immediately I hear, young lady, where is my tea? I sent you for some tea. And I'm trying to compose myself and to count to 10 backwards very, very slowly. And I turn to him and I say, Mr. Chairman, I am here attending this meeting in my capacity as a film producer and not here to do home office work. And you know, for me, it was just the reality of what people go through. I mean, he looked at me, he saw I'm a young person and decided I'm female and I can serve him tea. So for me, it begs the question, what are these unconscious biases that we have and what are we so scared of? And rising up and saying, no, I'm not going to serve tea. I'm not going to serve uh, tea at this point. No, the, I am here to attend a certain uh, meeting. And if you want your tea, there is a tea station. So I probably feel that organizations as a whole and as business leaders, we really need to look at our mindset. It is very difficult changing the mindset of one person. You can imagine how my relationship ended up with the chairman of that commission. But um, it is easier to change the culture within an organization. So for me, when we're addressing fears, I would like us to look at two as two factors of the mindset. One is institutional. What can an, organ an organization do to dispel those fears and to be aware? I think organizations at every level, HR, people in leadership, they need to be aware. What does it take for women to work? What are the things that they have to go through? And then secondly, for women, I think we need to really look internally and really decide, you know, am I here to do home office work? And when it comes to, I'll give other examples like, you know, volunteering for activities, you know, who are the people who volunteer when there's an office party, when there's an event in the office, it's women, but men are volunteering to be, oh, the MC fell off. Oh, okay, I'll be the MC, I'll chair that meeting. So women need to also change and shift their mindsets and look within themselves and see what can I do better? How do I shift from this position to a better position and stick my head out and say, I want to be better. I want to move up on the ladder. Thank you. Thanks, Alison, and, and for giving such a candid uh, encounter in terms of, yeah, you know, what a lot of women have to deal with when it comes to unconscious bias and gender stereotypes. You're usually the note taker or you're pouring tea for your fellow board members. And speaking of which, Karyuki, let me come to you because, you know, Alison mentioned the institutional changes that need to happen within an organization, right? So uh, from where you sit, what are some of the policies and strategies you've put in place to ensure uh, unconscious bias, gender stereotypes are challenged in your space? And, and how do you measure progress? I think, I think the first one is uh, once you've put, the first step is being conscious that you must do something about it. I think that's very, very important because once you make the first step, then you can start developing policies towards it. The second step is then you have to have very clear policies that are well documented. And then once you have the policies that are well documented, then the next thing that you must do, you must be able to follow up on that policies. And that's why it's important tone from the top is important because you can have a policy that is very well laid down, but everybody gives it, that, that completely ignores it. You must deliberately sponsor it and you must deliberately make sure that it's being executed. And then most of the policies that you will implement cost money as an organization. And so it's important, for instance, in, in, our, in, in our bank, we give people six months, six months of maternity leave. 
and with a seven month uh, seven month paycheck that's very deliberate you've got to say this is what we'll do if we are females and they need to take a break for maternity reasons you give them adequate support and also we give the the father fatherhood support as well a paternity leave also exists for men as well we give them two weeks leave so it's very deliberate you've got to see that this is a team effort and you're making sure that first of all you're putting the policies behind it and secondly you're putting money behind it and then and most important as well what policies are you creating to make sure that the female colleagues can be able to rise up in the organization how do you deal with the barriers? And both the panelists who've spoken up before me have mentioned them. Uh, when you want to come back to work, how flexible are you as an organization to accept the colleagues who want to come back to, to come back to work? Or do you tell them the job that you left has been taken? You're deliberately not bringing people back. That's very important. Secondly, when they come back and they've got a small baby, how deliberately are you supporting them so that they can be able to feel comfortable and they can bring their best to work, even with a small baby? That is important. And that you must deliberately do and support them to be able to achieve that. And then finally, as an organization, you must give yourself targets. It's not enough to just talk about these things without any targets that you want to achieve. Because as you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the corporate world, whatever gets measured gets done. If you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. And those measurements must be regularly discussed. We, we review them at the exco level. We review them at the board level. And when we fall short, then we ask ourselves, why are we falling short? We have, we have uh, for instance, in our policy uh, in the board that 40% will always, will always be either gender currently, so that to make sure that you don't then reach a place, then you skew too much on the other side. Currently our board is 40% female, sorry, 45% female. That's very deliberate because then you have to look for those people. We have to look for the right female uh, who can sit in the board, make sure they exist, ex call the same. So I think once you've come up with a, having the right mindset, having the policies in place, then you must put resources down to make sure those, 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 those targets are achieved. And then finally, you must have the targets and then you must measure them and hold yourself accountable to ensuring that they're delivered. Victoria. Fantastic. And, and really great to hear that you actually go back to see, have we actually met those targets? And beyond that, seeing where you've fallen short, uh, you know, that must really help in implementing. Soraya, you know, from our international, you've heard from Karaoke in terms of what Stanchart is doing to ensure they hit those gender targets. You know, we can check the boxes of tone at the top, wonderful, clear policies, great. Um, sponsoring through budget to ensure that more and more women are becoming, uh, you know, managers in the company. But from where you sit, what does employee engagement look like in ensuring gender targets, at least in your firm? Um, in our firm, we committed to increasing uh, the women being employed and, and, and in our, in, over the next three years up to 15%, which sounds modest, but given that we work in very, very remote communities and areas where women's participation is quite difficult due to cultural restrictions or sometimes there's a conflict in those areas. Uh, we think that we've set a pretty good goal for the next few years and we filter this through throughout the organization so that everyone from project managers and should I say the main senior managers, directors, the guy at the door, everyone realizes what we're hoping to achieve. So that the message is strong and it's not just uh, me shouting it alone or at board level alone, but ensuring that we push it down, the message goes down. Uh, for the jobs we are hiring, we are putting the pay according to the function and the job, so not according to the gender, and I feel that's really important because there are some roles uh, that people believe could only be do done by men. We had an uh, instance in Central African Republic in Bangui, where we had a construction work and we managed to encourage 11% women to be our masoners, to actually come and do what for them was an unusual type of job. So trying to get internally, we're pushing in to say, Think about jobs that you may not have thought of that you could do, specifically in the projects we work in in certain rural areas. And if you look at areas like Somalia, places like Darfur, Chad, which are quite remote, it's very difficult. But encouraging women to try something different as a skill set to see if they can do it and enabling them to do it. And one thing I've always felt was pretty key is hiring the right 
right kind of men who think that this is not just the right thing to do, that this is the best thing to do for us, for the company and for themselves. It's that inclusion, it's, the, it's, it's them not feeling threatened, but rather feeling the added value and the inclusion of of the women in in there now, if you imagine i mean myself as ceo of this company operating in some very uh, tricky conflict areas that are mainly with military personnel and i and alison i completely resonate with you i had a meeting set up with client and they asked me to make the tea and coffee and they were having the meeting with me but they didn't realize i was a woman so <laughs> i actually made all the teas and coffees then sat down and asked them what I could do for them and then promptly threw them out and said I wouldn't do it. But the thing is that unfortunately we do have these, these do happen, but getting angry, it's a complete waste of time. Getting it right is what we're trying very hard and dedicating teams to. We have a sustainability group that is pretty focused. They have focus groups talking to employees to ensure that we're engaging at all the different levels so that feedback can come from the ground up. Because if I don't know what needs changing, I can, we can make as many policies as we like, but we need to track the KPIs. And I resonate with what Carrie Cook said, KPIs, measure them, not just measure them by what, go in, talk to people, have the conversation, understand, is there anything we need to tweak, like the flexi hour, like the uh, enabling people to work from home, that will encourage this? Do we have to revisit our payroll? Do we have to look at the functionalities of the job? But making it uh, more, should I say, not gender friendly, but more inclusive for all, because I we need, we need everyone to buy into this and really buy into it and embrace the fact that it's good for all. I mean, Harvard Business Review said, well, was it 23%, you get 23% more better output by having a gender balanced team. And so that, that for me is something really critical that you see and we see it, the more women we get, better we work. Absolutely. And that's the power of having data and numbers to make the business case for women. You know, it's not just the right thing to do, but as you said, the best thing to do in many cases. Um, Alison, uh, you work in the media production space, you know, and, and oftentimes that comes with its own challenges uh, when it comes to evening the playing field for women to operate. You know, I know you have some initiatives that you've undertaken to empower women within your craft. Just talk to us more about what that entails and how they've been helped in terms of, you know, boosting their capacity in that area. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I've been very privileged at Alison to work on um, lots of projects around um, gender equality, reproductive health. I've done two big shows that have actually won awards, which is Siri and uh, Mali, which have all been donors uh, funded by uh, USAID, uh, UK Aid and PEPFA. And all these shows have been around empowering women around issues of reproductive health. And these age groups have been between 18 to 45. And some of the shows have been for young uh, young women and others have been for older women. I will probably cite the peri-urban rural um, a setting, which uh, is what Soraya is uh, also speaking to as well. I mean, in those communities, women are really, really disempowered by a lot of factors and culture presents uh, one of those issues. So I've done shows around reproductive health. How do you empower women to take HIV testing and counseling? And by showing them the importance of it, you know, they should know their status and it's more around uh, just creating awareness because awareness is high, high but how do you ensure that they you prevent them from catching uh, uh, HIV the issues of prevention mother to child transmission how if they're positive how do you empower them and tell them, this is not the end of the world you know you can still have a healthy baby and also dispelling the myths around going to, for antenatal care because when you go to rural areas women are like oh no the clinic is far I don't want to go it will take so much time I've got to feed my children and all those factors around that and the other one is about socioeconomic issues how do you tell women have children that you can 
a number that you can maintain, a number that you can take care of without so much heartache and pain. And then talking to the issues of GBV, uh, gender-based violence, and uh, a lot of women uh, encounter this in one stage, in one form or another, whether they're older women or younger women, and how do you empower them to say, look, this has happened to me, I need to seek help. And if I get help, I can get a prophylaxis. And if I get help, I would know how to deal with the stigma and to probably speak up to these issues uh, for myself. Then there's also issues of uh, multiple com concurrent partnership. You know, it's not just, you know, we live in an African society where, you know, you can have one more than, more than one wife. And the dangers that those presents and how to deal with it and how to address it. So women need to learn how to speak to these issues. So we design shows where you can create characters and these characters tell their stories and when we made this show, Siri, we had this character who was like really, really diverse. She was a, a, a typica on, uh, with five children on her seventh pregnancy. Her husband is uh, uh, this cult leader who is very adamant. He must have an heir to his throne. And uh, what happened with this story is that she loses the baby on the farm. And the women on the farm decide, hey, come on, you're on pregnancy seven. It's time to take a break. And they take her to hospital. She gets on contraceptives. Her husband discovers it. And it's a big issue. And they have to take the pills away. And he decides, no, you guys, we have to lock up in this house, pray and fast for 40 days. And at some point, she realizes, you know what, this can be happening to me. This really can't be happening to me. I can't be jobless. I can't be here. I'm not going to take my contraceptives and I could fall pregnant. And eventually it's a transformational journey where she gets her husband from, no, I'm not going to do this to a point of, you know what, actually family planning is important. It's important for you. It's important for me. It's for the good health of yourself, myself and our children. And there's nothing wrong with a girl child. So you don't really need another child because we can't even really afford that child. So it's the journey of transformation. And when we went through the research and measuring the impacts of the show, what a lot of people say it is, uh, especially women, women love telling stories and talking to each other. They love the characters because it relates to them. But also we found from the men and they said, wow, we really like that character on the show. It's a very strong dominant male, but it was nice to see his journey of transformation. And they said, you know what, we will support our women because it's better for us when we're having children we can take care of and we can empower them to also take up family planning and manage our families in a better way. So media is a great tool to use to educate and spur behavior change. And we've been very privileged to, to do a lot of shows around that uh, subject of reproductive health, of health, education. So we've been very happy. Yeah, we've got to use, and what I find with behavior change is that use characters that people can relate to, use stories that are not too far detached. Let them name those characters and say, that could be me, that's somebody I know. And that way they get to intertwine themselves with the issue and find solutions within the stories. Thank you. Amazing, Alison. And it's, you know, incredible. And you can never underestimate, you know, the power of media to dismantle those stereotypes. Something as simple as storytelling can be extremely transformative. Um, Karyuki, let me come to you just in terms of some of the challenges you've encountered when it comes to implementing many of these changes. You know, I'm sure in the process, and I've seen this from various reports from different corporates that say, you know, male employees would say things like this is reverse discrimination, or there's no need for gender quotas as long as performance targets are met. You know, so how do you deal with, and we heard from Soraya saying you need to hire really good men with inclusive mindsets in the event that does not happen. How do you challenge that? I think, I think the first one is, uh, first of all, to, to make the men and everybody realize that it's good for the company uh, to have gender balance and gender equality. That's very, that should be quite clear messaging. And that's why tone from the top is very, very important. Secondly is to call it out. If there's obvious bias, because we have to deal with biases, you have to call it out and say, probably the way you handle that meeting or you handle this uh, issue is not appropriate. And then you help the people know what is the appropriate way of handling it. And then you have to confront it. If people become cynical, and just like what you've alluded to it, if people become cynical, especially men, if they come up and say, what, what's your concern? We're delivering the numbers anyway. That's very short-sighted. That's very short-sighted. We have to accept that 51%, especially in Kenya, 51% of the population is female. 
51%. Uh, how do you make sure they are well represented in the organizations? Your customers are female, they are well represented. So you have to call out the biases. You have to deliberately tell people that this is the this is a decision that we have taken because it is important for the company and it's important for you to be supportive. And that's why it's very important for the men to be in this journey. And we evaluated to it earlier. We need allies. They need to be allies that they are supporting and they do it because it's the right thing to do. They are supporting gender equality because it's the right thing to do. And they do away with your cynicism to accept that this is the role I'll play. I'll make sure I'll be deliberate. Even my team, I've got female colleagues. I will make sure they are included. It's not just about diversity. You can be very diverse and very exclusionist as well. So you must make sure that you're driving the inclusion because people are diverse. You must make sure they're included. So that has to be deliberate as well. If someone is not uh, speaking up in a meeting or they're having certain challenges, how do you bring them in so that they feel included? That's the only way they'll thrive. And once they thrive, the company benefits and the entire society benefits. And we know, for instance, Victoria, you know, in this, in this country, a lot of the households are headed by females. What does that tell you? That if you deliberately channel more resources there, then the whole country will benefit. So it's being very conscious about dealing with the people, the resistance, and you're taking people along the journey, showing them why it is important for the company to follow, to follow the policies that they've laid out and making sure that the allies, the allies are really looking out for females and supporting them and making sure that there's a balance. And if there are any challenges, if there are any challenges, you have to resolve them. It is not enough to say, I'm doing a short list. There are no female applicants. Ask yourself if you put up a job for promotion, why are there no female applicants? Why is the short list only male? You must ask those questions, it must be deliberate. And you may find out, for, for instance, people will say, I didn't want to apply because a certain boss, maybe they don't like working with females. So unless you ask the questions and be very deliberate in what you want to achieve, you will not achieve. So it has to be very deliberate. Victoria. Indeed, indeed. And, and Soraya, let me bring you in on that same point because oftentimes the, the gender equality strategies can be dismissed as a zero sum game. You know, and I wonder from your perspective at RA International, how do you respond to the resistance oftentimes that exists to, to gender equality initiatives? The resistance is generally quite passive. It, it's latent. You, you, as, as Rico was pointing out, you don't, it's not so obvious uh, that you can see it. I mean, if you imagine I myself be, to be here and working in the countries where I work, the amount of resistance I met, and I was generally, I'd generally be met with a client looking at me and going, oh, you're a woman. And you'd be, oh, indeed, how surprised am I as well that I'm a woman doing this job? I'm extremely surprised. But hey, if I wasn't capable of doing this job, I wouldn't be here. And the, 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 I feel that a lot of organizations need to change the words that they use in describing some of the jobs or describing some of the, the um, employ, employees because men are tend to be described one way, women tend to be described another way. So things like uh, being emotional rather than saying she's actually quite competent, she's actually quite logical, she is extremely organized. They'll say, oh my God, she gets things done. No, she is extremely organized and competent because a lot of these words tend to stick. So when you say to someone, oh, she's so enthusiastic, she's always bouncing all over the place. As Alison said, the man says, oh, I'll be the MC," and the woman says, oh, I'll go pack the place. No, because actually you can say, she is the most dependable, reliable person that we have, that we'll, we know will get that deadline in by 3 p.m. as opposed to, I know she'll figure it out. So it's a lot of the word changing and how we approach the discussion internally uh, helps, I think, because when you set the tone right, you can deal with a lot of this passive um, bias, should I say. And once people utilize words that they see colleagues in a different manner. They see them with the words that are described as opposed to within the gender that they believe or they feel cannot be, cannot be. Uh, there's a lot of jokes that sometimes people don't understand is really sexist. It's unfair. It's not, you know, it, it doesn't help. And I try to clamp down on that a lot because some of it, the joke can be a joke and funny, but some of it can allude to other things. And when left to go too far, 
it expands, it puts people down, it, it, it puts negativity. We, we try and keep an organization that's upbeat. Wherever I go, especially in rural communities, I say, I'm a mother, I have, I'm, a, I'm a wife, I'm a sister, I've got brothers and I've got sons, and I have a husband. So I try and tell them, but here's the thing, I work so that I enable my children. So your wife by working will be enabling your children and setting that example and encouraging them to get the education that they need by going to school. And you would not want anyone to treat your mother in a poor fashion. So you should think about that when you're treating others in this organization in a very uh, poor, you know, poor manner with words or descriptions or the way you behave. And I think by get, just getting this mannerisms and even between women ourselves, once we can get the language right on how we describe each other and support each other internally, it sets the right tone. And if the tone sets, you're, you, you put a different front and, and that really pushes away this kind of passive aggressive bias that you find because it, it, it comes out really quickly when everybody has the right tone and the right language and somebody else doesn't you realize well actually I don't think you're in this to support the rest of this team and we're working as one it's all for it's one for all and all for one so if one is out then so be it but we don't take it Incredible. And, and I, I just love the fact that you mentioned language and terminology is so critical when it comes to describing the competence of female employees. Uh, yeah. Certainly something to think about. Um, you know, Alison, Catherine had mentioned something really interesting earlier, and, and she said, you can find people who will publicly commit to gender equality, but privately it's a different story. And, and I want you to speak more to, for instance, that leader who's struggling internally with driving a gender equality strategy within their company and wondering where to start. Maybe they don't have the time, the skill, support, and unfortunately for some of them, it's the will to implement. You know, what kind of advice would you give one who's in that space right now? Thank you, Victoria. So let's start with this leader. This leader could be male, this leader could be female. So if the leader is male, first of all, I think it would be good for them to acknowledge that they do genuinely have this issue at hand and that um, it is important for him to create awareness within the institution and also take a minute to think, what does it take to be a woman, to work as a woman? How do I empower? They are the male gender within the institution. Yes, Karuki has spoken about the tone of the institution, but it also takes you as an individual yourself to set those um, uh, examples. And uh, I like that everyone is saying, you know, whenever someone says something that is improper, you actually be the one to step up and call out. And at this point, actually, I would like to say, it doesn't have to be a formal setting, even an informal setting, because that's really who you are when you do it in an informal setting and call out these stereotypes and biases that don't really work. As for women, Women leaders, I really think uh, women are sit in a space where yes, you want to climb the ranks, yes, you want to do more, but then let's take a step back and ask ourselves, what is it that I'm doing? Where are my priorities when it comes to work, my personal life and my professional life? It's about creating that work-life uh, work life balance. You know, what is my priority in, as a professional? What's my priority? at a personal level. And then the art of delegation, women tend to want to do, and Soraya has alluded to it, yeah, I'm a good organizer, I'm good at this, yeah. So how do you learn how to prioritize and empower other, other people in the organization to be able to pick up and say, you do this, I'll do this. And at the end of the day, we are all working towards the same cause. And then I think also for women, it's about drawing what is, uh, what is home and what is work. Now, when I say what is home, I don't actually talk about the domestic situation. It's about looking at yourself and saying what is home to me what is important to me what is my priority and as the saying goes you know if things are not all right at home they're not all right at all if you're not winning at home you're not winning at all so you need to look at yourself and say this is what is important to me i want to climb this career ladder and this is how i want to climb it but you have to have and as, as business and sometimes as entrepreneurs you start it's not a scorecard where like you go to school and you say oh you've got to get an a so how do you measure success as an entrepreneur as a business person as a leader what's your measure of success what are the goals you've set for yourself 
and work towards them, but be very careful to create the life balances that work and have, and you can't do it alone. I think for me, my greatest mentors are, are male because they have a very different outlook to life. They're not scared. They're very courageous. They are bold. They'll go out and say whatever they want to say. And, you know, and everyone is looking like, what did he just say that? And if I say it, they'll be like, mm, it's maybe not really proper. So again, women have to carry each other and women have to strategize in such a way that, you know, I prioritize what matters to me and as well as working towards being the living example within your institutions, within your organizations, within also your social circles. Because as Sarai is saying, this little language that we have, we take it really for granted. How do you speak at home? How do you speak at work? How do you speak in a formal setting? So you should be, you are a creature of habit. So who you are is who you really are. So thank you. Thanks, Alison. Indeed, I have to give this very worrying statistic, Karyuki, as I set up your next question. You know, at the current rate, we are looking at 257 years to close the economic gender gap. Um, and clearly, this shows we need a lot more players on board. Here, we're talking about the corporate aspect, but we need government, we need civil society. Uh, you know, and various other players to ensure that we're accelerating that progress. You know, what kind of advice would you give to other stakeholders to help come on and, and buy in to, to this uh, initiative, if you will? Yeah, I think, I think the good thing is I'm certain that that number will achieve it way before 257, uh, because uh, if you look at what everybody is starting to do and being conscious, even having this forum and talking about it, you're starting there. It's like it's like the cutter. It's like a wheel. You start very slowly, and then it reaches a stage and it gets. It starts really spinning really fast. But I think on um, what more can we do? And this is specifically for men. This is a call out to men: is be be supportive. Uh, you have to be deliberate. And the reason I'm saying this for men particularly is because you are the ones holding the seats of power. If you take our own country, for instance, or the challenges that uh, the Kenyan parliament faced to pass the gender regulations, it was in parliament, it's composed mostly of men. So the power is really at the moment is in men's hands. And it's, it's important for men to realize that women are not a threat. They are not a threat in the boardroom. Uh, they are not a threat in, uh, they are not a threat at home. Uh, they are not a threat in, in, in the companies. They are our mothers anyway. I don't think there's anybody who will ever say my mother is a threat. So if we start from there, as basic as that, then how do you deliberately promote them so that it's just like you love your mother, how do you make sure that in the organization you give them equal opportunities? I don't think there's anybody, there's any man who deliberately exclude their mother and ensure that they are not, they are not rising or taking advantage of the opportunities that they should be ascribed to their mothers. And that's, that's a call to men. I think we, we need to be very, very clear about this. Let's be very deliberate, see that it's good for the countries, let's see that it's good for the economies, and it's very, very important for the companies and the organizations that we lead. And once we do what we must do, by being very deliberate about it, the organizations will change and the countries will change. And then something else is also, let's be active mentors and sponsors of women as well. Because in the organization, it's not just enough to be a mentor. You also need to sponsor, to sponsor the women. Be an active uh, sponsor, sponsor them in the boardroom because a lot of the decisions that are getting taken, whether it's on board uh, representation, whether it's on promotion, most probably there's no woman in that room to make that voice. So is there any man who deliberately says, I promote this lady for this, this she's very, she's capable and we should seriously consider her. We should make sure that she's shortlisted. She must, she must be had. Actively promote them because that's what men do. That's why they end up, that's why you'll find uh, in most of the organization or even in government, the names that are being forwarded for considerations are mainly the male because women don't have the sponsorship that they need to make sure that they are seriously considered for this, uh, for this, for these promotions or appointments. So it has to be deliberate. So for me, it's a, it's a call for us as men to be very deliberate and take an action and do something about it. Victoria. Certainly, certainly we need the men to be team players. You know, Soraya Karyuki has said, we will definitely close that gap before that 257 years is up. But let me just kind of add the pressure a bit because the SDG five is looking at achieving gender equality by 2030, right? So 
time is not on our side, but from where you sit, you know, what more can be done to, to accelerate this? I think it's critical that investors in companies, whether they are small companies, public companies like ours, should ask the question in the same way that they ask for the reports on the environment. They should ask the question on gender. They should ask the question on how many women are being employed. And they should ask the question of what is the organization doing, not just to hire women, because you can hire women and tick a lot of boxes that you've got people in there, but what are you doing to encourage their success? Because there's one element is just hiring them. The other one is to ensure they grow in the organization. They get the training, as Harry could said, sponsor them, sponsor them to go up the next level, to take them as far as they are willing to go. And it's not just the tick in the box. And investors should be asking companies for more information on gender performance, the ratio, the pay quality, the women. I mean, there's, what's the what's the point of saying we've got lots of jobs for women, but actually they're not on the correct, they're not on equal pay. It's that will create an even bigger imbalance when they come into the organization, realize they have actually been discriminated against as well as so. I think that once the investors start pushing companies, they're saying it's not just about your profit, but it's also about your social welfare within your company of how you are holding this company together. I'm a CEO, hold me accountable. Let me answer why I don't have. Let me try and show the policies that we've put in place. Let us try and encourage this to be a standard as doing your environmental safety for the house, a standard as everything else that we have have to report on and I think that once money as I always say once money starts talking people respond people respond because it affects the bottom line and if it affects the bottom line you see people make change pretty quickly pretty quickly they go out there and start activating it I mean the governments will try and I don't think that you know they'll get enough done but thank God now for social media, thank God for the spread of, of the word whereby we can actually use different methods to communicate with the young females that are out there who may be concerned that they don't have enough qualifications to apply for a job. But sometimes you should apply for the job and be honest about what qualifications you need so that the company can encourage you to get the qualifications to maybe go up. Because again, you can get somebody with great qualifications and absolutely zero motivation. Whereas you've got lots of women out there with huge motivation, maybe not enough. And organizations need to pull that in as well and try and pull the resources for that. But let investors ask the questions from companies and push them to the wall to say, where's your gender ratio? What are you doing about it? What's your pay scale? It'll make it'll make it happen sooner, I think. Absolutely, making gender equality part of strategy and really putting your money where your mouth is. Um, oh, yeah. Alison, let me let me bring you in here because um, Karaoke said it: the power is in the hands of men, right? And in order for us to really start to see an acceleration of, of gender equality initiatives, we have to get the men on board. We've heard some suggestions Karayuki gave um, in terms of what male champions can do. Um, and we'd love to have more Karayukis on board, but you know, we're, we're in an African context and we know it's, it's male dominated, it's patriarchal, and it's a very different setup and therefore that's much more challenging to push this. Um, a study from, from Boston Consulting Group showed that when gender diversity efforts had men actively involved, 96% reported progress. So the numbers back this up of having men on board, but you know, from our context, speaking from an African space, you know, how do we actually get men to actively buy in from your perspective? Thank you, Victoria. Um, first of all, I'll say when I'm shooting corporate videos, the one challenge I have is women don't want to appear on camera. Anytime I'm told interview this person, 
oh, the men are like, yes, I'll take the interview, send me the questions immediately. So I also find myself challenged in the fact that, you know, I want to see more women on screen and telling their stories and telling the success stories of their organizations and the jobs that they do. So it is a bit of a challenge. And I, I would say probably, you know, men have a bigger role here to play because they are sitting at the top positions. So when opportunities come up, I would recommend that as as Karaoke said, you know, it's it's setting the tone from the top and leading from the top. You know, let's talk about those sponsorship uh, women we're sponsoring at the board level. Let's have those success stories, those remarkable women. Let's affirm women as well. Men also need to speak from a position of affirming the role that women play when it comes to business and and also uh, in society as a whole. Because if you can do that, then it it steps that it pushes that forward and women sometimes we do need that push and if it's coming from the corner of the men then it, it will work better and it, it will work for us i also feel that um when it comes to aspects of 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 coaching networking i think even in the boys clubs we need to encourage men need to encourage women to come into those boys clubs a little bit and you know get a feel of networking how else is this woman going to step up and move to the next level where are the decisions being made where are the policies being made where is the brainstorm being done of big issues that pertain to country. So I, th I feel this is a great uh, space. I, I feel for men, where do they start? Men start at home. What sort of dad are you? What sort of a husband are you? You know, you start at home. Make it at home. Tell your kids, your daughters, your sons, empower them, give them the right narrative. And when it leaves there, well, your daughter, your sons will go to school. They'll meet other girls, other boys in school, and they'll tell them, hey, come on, you can't make that rude joke of a, about a girl, or you can't make that rude joke about a boy. Oh, that's not a sport for boys only. Even we girls can play that sport. So you start it at home and then trail it through to the other se segments of, of society. It's rather unfortunate that, you know, culture plays such a big big role and currently even in Kenya there is a building being discussed today on the same and um, it's a tough journey but we can't give up I mean it's not a zero-sum game we've got to be up there and fighting and and doing it and and uh, I feel with champions as men yes it's good but also women need to self-promote and champion their own causes and not expect that someone else is going to do it for them and create women need to open doorways and create space for other women thank you Fantastic. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, Allison. And just before we wrap up, um, we have a few questions coming in for the panel. I'll just sample a few. This one going to Karaoke. And they're asking, as a business leader and champion of change, who inspires you to advocate for women's equal representation and leadership? I think it's uh, it's. There are different different people inspire me. Whether it's both, and they are both female and male, very very balanced. I mean, the most recent inspiration is Gozi. When I look at her history, how she's gotten to where she's gotten, and how tough it has been, you see, it's there's a, there's a very good story there. There's a very good story how she's rose from where she's from from when she was young in an African setup that we are talking about to where she's reached now. It's a very inspirational story. And you see, it's also very deliberate. So some of these actions, people take them. If you take the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, look at what is done in his parliament and in the country as well. These are very deliberate actions that these people inspire me that it can be done. But I think just to, just to tell you, I think why, why I believe that the journey will be made. If you think about it, Victoria, it, is, it, it surprises a lot of people when you tell them in the banking sector, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, women couldn't get a mortgage. 20, 30 years ago, uh, because there are women, it was not, it was just not available for them. The retirement age was different. Uh, the women retired earlier. So when that's why I was saying it, things change, things are changing and they'll just, it becomes like a wheel. It's just moving, it's moving a lot faster now. And today the debate is no longer about this is available to this gender and it's not available to this gender. That debate is no longer there. So it's how quickly we, we accelerate this. But I think for me, so it's looking at what those people have deliberately done learning that there's courage and you have to lead the change it is not enough to be inspired and do nothing about it you have to, you have to be inspired and then say this is my opportunity this is my opportunity now and this is what i will deliberately do to drive the agenda forward very very important victoria 
Absolutely, absolutely. Being deliberate about your actions uh, is critical. Another one here for, I guess this is going to go to both Soraya and Allison. Uh, what is one piece of advice you would like to share with fellow women that are aiming to shatter the glass ceiling in the business world? So Soraya, I'll start with you. I would advise women not to think too hard about it. Don't overthink it. Sometimes we overthink things too much and then we put up unfortunate barriers in our own minds about maybe it's gonna work, maybe it's not gonna work, how will it work? I just powered through. I just put one foot in front of the other day to day, every single day, move forward, move forward. Every time somebody says it's not possible, Think to yourself, yes, it is possible. I just haven't found the way. There is another way. I just haven't found the door, but it is possible. So maybe I will walk around that building. I will climb that hill. I will go around the corner, but one foot in front of the other daily and never giving up on yourself because you might be rock. Uh, you might think that your path lies in this particular field, but along the way, something might come along and divert you the other way. Go with that flow. Don't set yourself up to say, I need to be in box X by this date, because you could be somewhere completely different in a better position by just following your heart and powering through every day, one step in front of the other step, not putting the monumentous goal that is easily, it, it, you make such a big goal uh, and then suddenly you don't get there and you demoralize yourself. But my daily steps, I know I can do that. It makes me happy at the end of the day and I'm always getting somewhere, always getting somewhere. Absolutely. As the Chinese principle says, um, a journey of a thousand steps begins with one. Exactly. So it's incremental, incremental. I'll, yeah. I'll be taking that to heart. Absolutely. Allison, your insight? Picking up on the steps. Yes, one step at a time, one leg before the other. We can't take a step with both legs at the same time. And as women take each step at a time, let us learn to celebrate. Even those small wins, the big wins, even the failures, let's celebrate them because they are getting us somewhere. So I am a big fan of let's, let's self-promote. Let's talk about what we're doing. Let's also talk about what other women are doing and not just sit back. Actually, one of my mantras is be don't become we're not just be don't become you already are so fabulous and so good at what you're doing so just be believe in yourself and just be you will get there thank you be don't become i love that just promoting that whole idea of self-belief thank you allison and, and just as we bring this session to a close I'd like to kind of bring up a call to action from all of you. You know, what can you commit to personally to get better at leading on diversity and inclusion in your respective organizations? I'll just repeat that again. What can you commit to personally get better at in leading on diversity and inclusion in your organization? Karyuki, I'll start with you. I'll, I'll take from this year's theme, continue challenging the stereotypes, continue challenging that which holds the women back, continue challenging when we get short lists for promotions, if there's no women on the list, challenge and ask why, why isn't there any women? That's what I'm committing to do. And for me, most important is to make sure that those KPIs, I'm doing them because I believe it's the right thing to do, not because I'm being asked to do, but because it's the right thing to do. That's my commitment. Thank you. Fantastic. Soraya? Uh, from my side, I would say that we're going to ensure that diversity and inclusion matters and gender equality matters as part of performance reviews. So that it is actually a KPI that's registered within performance of management, within performance of human resource department, within the performance of the company as a whole, so that we can actually collect the data, measure the data, and ensure that we are reviewed, not just individually, but collectively on what did, what, did, what did we do and what can we do better. We can only push it further if we know what we haven't done. Indeed, indeed. Alison, last word goes to you. 
Well, um, I think uh, for ourselves, as I said earlier, you know, one of the challenges is I do actually struggle having more women on camera. So I do want to have more women on camera and not necessarily on camera. Most cameramen are men. So we need more women behind the camera as well. So I'm committing to work with more women in the technical jobs that women sort of shy away. You wanna do wardrobe, you wanna do makeup, you wanna do a bit of screen appearance. So we're gonna work harder to get more women on the technical scene. And as well as uh, in the work that we do, the behavior change communication that we do and the stories that we tell, we will advance the gender narrative and want to create more equality and try and kill the stereotypes with every narrative and story opportunity we get so that we empower both women and men and we all become champions of change. That is what we commit to. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much to my distinguished panelists. Uh, amazing insights coming out of uh, this session's discussion. And with that, I just want to thank all of our speakers, Ms. Catherine Musakali, uh, the founder and chair of Women on Boards Network, Mr. Kariuki Ngari, the managing director and chief executive Officer of Standard Chartered Bank, Kenya and East Africa, Ms. Soraya Narfelt, CEO of RA International, and Ms. Allison Gibguini, the CEO of Allison Production for the engaging conversation. My goodness, I've learned a lot. Uh, we hope you, our audience, have enjoyed spending time with us at the Kenya Action Dialogue under the theme, Tackling Biases and Backlash Against Gender Equality. Now, in 2020, I must mention this, uh, Global Compact Network Kenya was the only country in Africa and one of 19 globally to roll out the first round of the Target Gender Equality Program. And we commend the 14 front runner companies that signed up and are working through the 10 month accelerator program to ensure they turn their commitments into action. We heard a lot about that during the discussion. Now the Kenya network is happy to announce that it will launch round two of the program and is inviting more Kenyan companies uh, to set and reach ambitious corporate targets for women's representation and leadership in business. Please continue to follow the conversation on social media using the hashtag target gender equality it has been my pleasure moderating this session. Thank you all for joining us and enjoy the rest of the event. My name is Victoria Rubadiri.